Hi, I'm here with John Kenny, one of the old guard? Is that the correct term from HP? I guess. Yeah. Days? Been yeah, none of this Keysight stuff. He's an original HP guy. 30 um, years. Th 30? How many? 40. 40? Jeez, you get less for murder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, so you're a, you're a company man. From since college, yes. Since college. That's right. Right out right. of school. Excellent. Well, let's tell us how did you start at HP and uh, what you do these days. So I, I started at HP because I wanted to be in the audio business because I love music. Mm -hmm. And I went to the interview there and I discovered that power supplies are just like audio. Big heat sinks, power yep. transistors, transformers, you know, low frequency signal processing and uh, well, my control theory came into hand, so I, I started designing power products for many years. Discovered I liked the firmware side of it. Mm -hmm. After a while, got into firmware. And then a lot of our firmware technology has moved into digital and FPGA, so I got into that. And then I got into management because I knew all the different areas and I could tell people they were full of it when they, they would tell me things. <laughs> got it. And from there, I went from power product management into product line management where I got involved with the voltmeters, the function mm -hmm. generators, the data act. The, those teams, so a lot of the products now, and I've actually done design with them because of common components. My job today is more or less, uh, I like to think of it as somebody who moves from project team to project team all throughout the company, finding technology that someone's developed that's the best, and then transferring it through the different organizations. Got it. So what is your title these days? Technology and Efficiency Management. Efficiency. I'm going to assume that efficiency does not mean power efficiency. Absolutely not. No, it means... It means getting more products out for the same engineering, not less ah, products. Okay. For, you know, not less money for the same products. More right. products for the same engineering. So, for example, the the thirty four four sixty front panel. Yep. That design is now used in, I guess, about six or seven products. Right. So that was a deliberate push to go in that direction. Correct. We're doing that yep. more and more, trying to. So we make our SMUs use the same internal technology for some of those pieces as our voltmeters, as our mm -hmm. counters, function generators. Uh, we've actually got a new a lower cost one that we use in the new power supplies right. because it wasn't priced right for the price points we have to hit for power products. We actually took it down another price point and that's going to be spread through many products in the future. Interesting. So when did that sort of focus change? When you know, decided, look, we need a common about eight, or, about or has it always been around in some form? Well, there was the original 34401 voltmeter. Yep. That technology spread into probably eight or ten products. The data right. act products were based on that. The nano voltmeter was based on that. Believe it or not, the 3631 power supply oh. actually has the voltmeter chipset inside of it. So they did it a long time ago, and somehow when we got the small part of a bigger company like Hewlett Packard, that stuff fell out of favor. We were starving those teams. Mm -hmm. Now we're kind of bringing back that the renaissance, if you will, of these products to make them more efficient, to make to cover more space. And now that we're solely a test and measurement company, we're not mm -hmm. giving all our money to start life sciences or computer companies. Uh -huh. We're really refocusing and growing the company again. It's a lot more exciting today than it was 10, 15 years ago. Interesting. So you started in 78? Correct. 1978, straight out of college? That's right. Did they recruit you? Or did they come into the colleges and recruit, or how did that they happen? They did, but the, I went to Lehigh University, and they didn't recruit at Lehigh. They recruited right. at the, some of the bigger schools. So luckily, uh, the power products development was done mm -hmm. in New Jersey, and I... Was right. born and raised in New Jersey, it was right down the road from me, so it was an easy play for me. I didn't know they ever did anything in New Jersey. We used to have a very large manufacturing center in New Jersey. Right. Now it's all in Penang. Right. Uh, we've moved everything to Penang for efficiency. Yep. I had nothing to do with that, yep. but uh, we've got rid of most of the U.S. manufacturing. In fact, the, the voltmeters were originally mm -hmm. manufactured in Loveland, where the design yes. team was, the yep. power product. I thought that was the only design group was in Loveland, really, or the main one. Um, where, where were the design centers? Well, in at its peak when we were Hewlett Packard, we yep. had probably 30 or 40 design centers oh, all around wow. the world. Today, wow. if you take the RF off the plate yep. and the scopes, uh, we have design centers in Loveland, we have it in Bud Lake, New Jersey, we have Penang, we have Hachiochi, yep. and we have Singapore. Right. So that's everything that's not RF is done in those five design centers. Very interesting. Why so many design centers back in the day? Was it? So it, it's really scatter the jobs around. Was no, it? No, no. Bill and Dave were amazing yep. guys, and one of their things that they really believed in, in order to foster the maximum amount of innovation, was diversity. Right. So as soon as a site got above a certain size, they would cleave off a piece of it like a piece ah. of dough and stick it somewhere else and let it grow into a new site. So we started organizations in Loveland, started organizations in Spokane, Washington, mm -hmm. and then Lake Stevens. Uh, and the computer group did the same. They would get to a certain size and then they'd spin off another group. 
in a new location near a different set of universities to get a different pool of technology. Got it. And that was a great thing for the day when innovation and design was really all that mattered. Yep. Today, it's somewhat of a blessing and a curse. And mm. the, uh, the ability for people to get efficiency compared to some of our competition, it's much more difficult because everybody does their own thing and you don't get common design, you don't get common parts, you don't get shared knowledge as much as some of our competitors okay. who are all located in one building down in Austin uh -huh. or, or maybe in, in Germany somewhere. They're much more vertically integrated and they can enforce common, common design practices. Right, interesting. So did you know Bill and Dave? I were they still, they were still technically there in the late 70s. They were still there in the late yep. 70s. I met both of them once, but yep. I was very young. I was, I was telling Simon <laughs> that uh, my boss at the time was working on the HP 3000 computers, yep. and Bill, he, he came to visit and to go over some negotiations and some technical stuff with him, and I'm sitting at my bench, and all of a sudden, Dave, there's somebody I'd like you to meet, and I turn around, and there's Dave Packard, all <gasps> six, five of them, and I'm, and I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I, I didn't yep. know what to do. Right. I was there for about a year when that happened. But they would come, back in the yeah, day, yeah. they would come to all the sites. Yep. There weren't as many, of course. They would come to all the sites once a year and visit everybody. And in fact, our CEO, Ron Ersessian, uh, who was actually from our New Jersey Power mm -hmm. Products group originally, I worked with him for quite, quite a few years, went to school with him. Not with him, he went to the same university I did, just came back to our site. So we're kind of bringing back some of the Bill and Dave okay. practices to make sure that we're all one company. And that was the smaller. management by walking about That's principle correct. which became famous in this. Yeah. We're trying to recover some of the good stuff. Right. We are okay. the original Hewlett Packard. Yes, right. Now, the, well, let's talk about the spin-offs. How, when did they happen? How? Why? Obviously, the first, so <laughs> it was Hewlett Packard until then it changed to Agilent. How did that go so, down? Was it well received internally? Was it? It was a very interesting transition. That was the, the Carly days, some of the yep. darkest days of Hewlett Packard. And yep. I think there was one of the board members was uh, Hewlett's son. Walter Hewlett, I think it was. Right. And he was very much afraid that Carly was going to gobble up and destroy everything in her zeal to be ambitious and grow herself. Right. As in, a fear, we're talking about the test and measurement Correct. stuff? Right. Th th that would be gobbled up. That would gobbled be. up and shut down and yep. turned into a super cash cow, and he didn't right. want that to happen. So yep. they, they made a decision to spin us off the, the life sciences and the test and measurement into a solely separate entity so that yep. the computer group could be completely independent. And part of that is also, you know, the, the stock market wants a clean concept for a company so they know how to put it in their portfolio right. the right way. The yeah, HP was big. It had its tentacles in so many different areas. That would have been a right. hindrance, so, right? Well, I mean, the biggest thing really was the market drivers. I was explaining this to Simon that when you're a portfolio manager, you want to have a certain split of this kind of stock and this kind of stock and this mm. kind of stock. And we represent a problem for those people because we're not a kind of stock. We're right. a, a multi a conglomerate. Now, if we're bigger and a true conglomerate like a GE or a Danaher, mm -hmm. those companies are not renowned for the products they make. They're renowned no. for their business management. Yes. Okay. And they keep companies as long as they can milk them and make money. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they're not number one and number two, out they go. So yep. like Danaher just spun off. The Danaher time. business system. Yeah. That's right. And, and a... GE business system the yep. same. We All didn't right. want to become that. So they spun Got us it. off as a wholly separate entity. And it worked for a while as Agilent, but then it was also a problem when we were a life sciences and a test and measurement company. Yep. Which one are you? And it was hurting the test and measurement part quite a bit because every dollar we made, we were becoming a cash cow to fund this growing life sciences ah, business. So they right. made a decision that you know that was going to yep. hurt us, and we were actually going to be a liability. So they spun us off again as Keysight, and now we're a, a pure T and M play. And what we love about it, being part of that test and measurement business, is we're really focused now. We're really 100% of every dollar we make goes back to making us grow. In the test and measurement space, Correct. nothing else. Mm -hmm. Nothing else distracts you. Mm -hmm. HP started out as a test and measurement company. Mm -hmm. Did, were they disappointed they didn't get the HP name? Absolutely. Or, were, or, that had, or so, it had it, been, had it been corrupted by the computer? No, no, twi Division, no twice. They, everyone was disappointed. We would have loved to have the Hewlett Packard name. Yep. Um, some of our competitors have said, would you trust somebody who's changed their name three times in yeah, 10 yeah. years? <laughs> um, don't care for that, but uh, it's taken. It's cost us a, 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 right. a negative, if you will, to have to change names and build up that brand mm -hmm. reputation again. Uh, I think we're at the point now where it's not likely to happen again. We'll grow it back, yep. and we're fine. It's a good name. We don't have any issues with it. Um, it's not something we'd like to have done, done but uh, mm. and we certainly wish we kept the Hewlett Packard name because there were. You, Bill and Dave are still yep. legacy famous everywhere you go. They're yep. known for creating Silicon Valley and, mm -hmm. and spinning off some of the largest companies in the world. I mean, Apple was started by Hewlett Packard. Yep. So, yeah. Did you know, you wouldn't have known was back in the day when he, no. he was in he the was calculator California's. division. He, was, yeah, yeah, he wasn't right. part of uh, my world yep. at all. 
Right. So, everyone was disappointed in HP. Did they like the name Agilent? I, I didn't mind. I thought it was okay. I didn't really have anything Agilent against it. Was, I think the only de negative was that right before we spun off, AT&T splintered into many companies, and one of those companies mm. was Lucent. So we became ah. Agilent, and Lucent didn't go well, as you probably yep. know. They got gobbled yep. up eventually by Alcatel and mm -hmm. for pennies on the dollar. So this, this naming thing seemed kind of fake. And okay. I think the Keysight name was viewed much better. And right. It's also it was viewed better internally because outside it was a bit of a almost it was like key site. It was like designed by committee or something. No, it, I don't know. It's it a was, tough thing. Naming is a tough yeah, thing. Yeah, we don't have the yep, Bill totally. and Dave was great. And in fact, Hewlett Packard yeah. is a funny story because for years it was Hewlett Packard. You weren't yep. allowed to call it in any advertising HP. Right. And Interesting. Literally, the, the the day that Bill Hewlett passed away, yep. they started calling it HP. Carly wanted to call it oh, HP, yeah, but okay. he, was, he, he passed away, and Interesting. she immediately demanded that everything started becoming HP, because you know, it's a it's Yeah, a yeah, no, it's hard. Right. That's why in the industry it's just, oh, it's just HP. Right, but you they know, refuse. It's, it's my right. name on the company. You say the whole thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> I can totally understand it. Yeah. Why not? Mm -hmm. You're the one in charge. Right. I think part of the Keysight name is also the Keysight look. As you see, we're yep. changing all of our products to the black and red, and a lot of that was perceived negatively by the engineers because it's work. Right. And it requires us to change everything. Yeah. And it's been a challenge to get the uh, user interface, the the, mm -hmm. the look and feel right. And the, the black on black has been a challenge. It's getting better. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that we, people are starting to see, though, is it makes us us. It's right. becoming our identity. It's a fresh new start. And Got it. I think that's starting to become perceived more positively. Um, it's taking time. It costs yep. money. And it, one of the things that does take your eye off the ball, you're, you're busy focusing mm -hmm. on the way things look as, in colors as opposed to how good is the product. So there is a cost to it, but I think it's going to be a transitory cost. Do you, when you're making a huge transition like that name, did, sorry, did the black look and feel come after? After. Uh, it came after, right? right. We yeah, spun and off then, and then about right. a year and a half later we started doing I it thought so. Time. Why did you think that you needed a new look and feel? Well, we wanted to be ourselves. We wanted right. to be our own company. Okay. We weren't, the, the ba everybody else has copied us. And there's right. all these other products have that beige look. We invented yep. that, and we're ready to be the, the new key site, and that's just really kind of sticking our own turf. And yep. like I said, it's taken a while, but it's okay. really starting to have a positive impact. Do you do something like that internally, or do you just hire consulting, like a brand consulting companies to do to help no, no, out we, or we to did, do it? It was or done what? internally, and yeah? uh, okay. in fact, uh, there was something that Ron really wanted to do, uh, the, the Ron. staff, Ron Nersessian, oh, right. yep. and his staff, they really felt it was important for us to make our new mark, to let, send a strong message to the world and to us internally that we are now a pure test and measurement company and we're our own selves. We're not part of anything else, we're yep. just ourselves. Fantastic. Yes, and it shows in all the decisions. I'm very happy with some of the direction we've shifted to, yep. the renewed focus on a lot of our products, a greater amount of investment, and all that money we're not giving to life sciences is going back into the company. So how is um, Keysight doing financially? So I, I haven't looked. Are they, are they still like a very profitable? The challenge has been trans transitioning from a cash cow, which generates mm. great profit, to a profit and growth play. Okay. So now we're, we're really starting to grow. We're, we're making our numbers every quarter for six straight quarters. Nice. Our stock is up nicely, and yep. that's really what we want. That's what, there's no question about it, and we have a lot more to go. Excellent. Yes. Is there any pressure from being a publicly listed company to uh, kill off things that aren't very profitable, or do you can you get by with you know things that aren't go like like products you really like, but they're not really profitable, or is every successful the public the, the stock market doesn't look that closely under the okay. they look at the right. aggregate total yep. and they expect you to understand to make the moves you have to make to make the to numbers work. Do that. And, and we are very ruthless about that. If we do things that aren't making sense, we don't yep. want them in our portfolio. It makes our numbers look bad, and our, our results right. are bad, and we're not generating funding for new things. We don't want to keep it in there. We don't need the market to tell us that. So you started out as a technical guy? Absolutely. Are, are you still, do you still get your hands dirty? Or? One of the things I tell people is I like to keep my feet on the street. So yep. like that 34460 front panel, I designed that. Oh, you okay. designed that. I designed that front panel. Simon, give us the meter. And we go. it was an interesting story because we had a lot of price pressure on that to replace the 34401, which was the most successful product in test and measure, Hewlett Packard test and measurement history. Okay. It, it was the most successful product. We sold more logos yep. on that 34401. It was by far and away, at its peak, we sold over 25,000 a year. 
Twenty five and how long ago? He was on the market for twenty Over plus 20 years. years. Eighty four or eighty five. Wow. A yeah, long time. Wow. So you actually designed I designed this. the electronics for the front yep. panel, yep. Fantastic. Oh, you actually designed the electronics. That's correct. For the front. Wow. There you go. You're the manager at your how high are you up the arc? You're pretty well, high I'm, up. I'm the, the second highest level of individual. Yeah. I don't have direct reports. I influence, I'm a, a strong influencer of a lot of different organizations. Yep. But what this team needed was they needed a product that was modern enough to really replace the 3441. And yep. they didn't know how to meet the cost. They didn't know how to add the functionality. And I got together with them and we came up with a super simple, clean design. Yep. One of the benefits coming from the power product side was power products are the most attacked from underneath of all of our product lines. Ah, So we were always more sensitive yep. to cost and more aware of how to get low cost than probably all the other product classes. Mm -hmm. And this team, when they developed the 34401, they did an, um, the most amazing job. I mean, I, yep. I look at that design, it's just one of the most elegant, simple, clean, just enough to get the job done. Right. And when we went to do this, they were struggling to figure out how to get that same uh, elegance. Yep. And that was my job was to come in and help them achieve that. Now, they had to do the same thing on the voltmeter technology inside. I did not get directly involved in that. Right. And they did an amazing job on that. I mean, this voltmeter is, is as simple and as clean as the mm -hmm. 34401 was in its day, but the combination of the two, they've now taken this technology and brought it into all of our other products. Yep. Okay. And that's really what's made a difference now. Is that, uh, When I say efficiency, it's, it's efficiency in the development cost of the products mm -hmm. to get as much shared reuse across all those different products. And also because when our customers use this, the expectation is they're going to use that. It works the same. It's easy to use. It's, they already yep. know how it works. Yep. And that's that's another efficiency because what we had in the past was each group would develop their own web browser interface, their own file manager interface, their own firmware update method. Mm -hmm. You know, and our customers just go. It's nasty. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also it's hard for us to keep the quality that very high. We're testing three times or five it. times as many things. So. Yeah. My job is to shut down the multiple different ways of doing things and make it mm -hmm. one way. That's the best way. Yep. Okay. So you laid, you designed the front panel electronics, you laid out the board? Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm stunned. I like Thank you very one. much. Oh, you I, like, I, I guess you I'm like impressed. This one. Oh. I'm impressed. Good. Um yeah, that's somebody that high up would you know, uh, did you like obviously people you had no shortage of people who could have done that. But did you go S surprisingly enough the thing that was the oh. reason I got involved in it was because they didn't know how to meet the cost goals we had to hit. Ah. So they could do that. This front panel, yeah, the yeah. assembly cost about sixty-five dollars. The the board and the loading yep. of the board, and the design they came up with was about fifty-nine dollars. But instead of being a vacuum, instead of being an LCD, it was a vacuum fluorescent. Mm -hmm. They said you can't put out a product in, in, in twenty ten without a color LCD. Yep. And we worked very hard, and some of the team did a lot work to find a vendor that made a high quality display mm -hmm. that was low cost, and. We came up with an integrated design. We actually had to work with our internal people to, to use a lower cost processor and reduce parts count. And that's something I have a lot of familiarity with. Got it. So, so you thought you could do the job really well and you went in there and did it? We did it. And it, what's fun about it wow. now is they now are much more dangerous about doing low cost and minimal design than mm -hmm. they were in the past. So that's continued through a lot of the other products. Because oh. I only have to do it once and show them the way and then they can follow it from there. Yeah. And the funny thing was when the original 34401 was done, those guys were aces at it. They just mm -hmm. they were amazing at it. But what happened was we moved all our manufacturing to Penang. Yep. And it's much more difficult for people to get on planes and fly, you know, thirty hours to of get course. to Penang. I was already doing that quite a bit. I worked with the Penang team to do the low cost products. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of that knowledge and I was still going over there and I brought a lot of that to them and helped share that. We've taken this design now and propagated it through our Japanese organization, which I'm visiting later this week. Um, our Penang organization does it a lot, and we're looking at other products we can implement it in, these lower cost methodologies. Fantastic. So when was this originally, when did you start working on this? I guess about eight, ten years ago. Oh, that long. And when did it come out? Six, eight years ago. I don't know the exact dates. Right. My so what, what is uh, the development cycle? Well, for this, because this was a completely new product from the ground up, basically, wasn't it? Almost. It, it, you use some of the old sampling architecture, I think. Yes, it's multi slope, right. but it's yep. not using an ASIC. The original 34401 mm -hmm. used an ASIC, and ASIC costs have skyrocketed. And you can now do more with off the shelf than you could. The quality of the components and the, the, the switches yep. and things like that, you don't have to get an ASIC to, to performance anymore. So this is done with discrete off the shelf parts. And no, there's a, there's a mm -hmm. custom FPGA inside, but yep. that's about it. This was one uh, question on the forum. Um, somebody asked, 
FPGA versus ASIC this day, these days. I okay. mean, you, HP did a lot of ASICs. We had our own internal IC. We still do yeah. have our own internal IC right. facilities. But as the nanometers have shrunk, yep. the mask set costs have risen dramatically. Got it. Okay. And where we used to do analog in analog ASICs to get mm -hmm. matching of resistors and things like that, today you can buy that. Right, yeah, you can buy an off-the-shelf 0.01% resistor and right. whatnot. And switches, you know, the yep. leakages and, and things like that and the resistance of the switches is much better, whereas yep. before you had to do an ASIC to get that level of performance. Got it. So is there any, uh, well, apart from the scopes which have the MegaZoom now see, in their case, ASIC. they had to develop their custom ASICs. Yep. They have a custom A to D and a custom digital ASIC yep. that takes the data real time at gigahertz mm -hmm. sample rates and actually builds the entire display in the ASIC. Yes. And then they pipe that right out to the display yep. to give you that super uh, fast. In case you have to get that performance, that instant response performance right. thing. Right. But on instruments like the ones you work on, because you're not in the oscilloscope division, you're in the what do you so cover? We're, you cover? We're part of the ISG, which is the Electronic Instruments and Systems Group, is you know voltmeters, counters, function generators, data acquisition supplies, mm -hmm. uh, SMUs, so our yep. Hachiochi team, a uh, board test, anything that's not RF or super high speed. It's, and the company deliberately differentiates scopes because they're essentially R, they're RF type, they're high speed. Super, super high speed. High right. speed right. RF and also, type stuff. Most of the, the scopes are kind of divided into two halves. We have our mm -hmm. high performance group and we right. have our high volume group. Got it. Okay, and the high performance group is chasing the 60 gigahertz plus to test yep. the latest PCI Express uh -huh. dot, whatever it is, yep. you know, in the super fast DDR memories. Um, that's price is secondary to performance in those guys. The, the high volume scope guys is price is everything. They, they are they are as good as or better than anybody in the company at hitting price points. They're amazing. I work closely with them to understand the mm -hmm. tricks they've learned so I can pick them up and bring them into these guys. So mostly you'd be targeting FPGAs these days because they're, but they're still not cheap in volume, are they? they like for a decent size one, they're not. So what's happened is, is they shrink the process geometry of an FPGA. You get mm -hmm. more for the same amount of money. Yep. But the price doesn't drop. You get more and more transistors. Yep, yep. And one of the interesting technological challenges with FPGAs is figuring out how to take advantage of all those mm -hmm. transistors. And that means we have to move more and more of the functionality of the product mm -hmm. into the digital domain. Yep. Now, the good news is that's the general trend. So in power products, for example, where we used to do all analog feedback, we're moving almost all our new designs are doing Every digital, digital Almost feedback. all digital. Right. And right. we're doing that in FPGAs today. But there's a new technology, not new per se, but the one that's coming on very strong, and that mm -hmm. is, you know, TI and other companies are coming out with better and better DSP technology. Yep. And they're they're competing with the low end of the FPGA market. In fact, a lot of our FPGAs we build microprocessors inside the FPGA and soft to get state machines and things like mm -hmm. that. So the challenge is what can you do with all those those gates and all those multipliers and accumulators and stuff to get more and more functionality. So you're from a power background. That's where you're I started, a, yeah. You started in the power group. What are the I do uh, do, do you prefer the analog stuff, or do you think that, or do you see advantages in the new DSP digital approach to power supply digital power oh, supply? So is the performance, the, the performance the response is better? The stability is better in digital. Well, digital. When people first started to do digital, they basically implemented yep. analog circuits in digital. So they took right. an op amp integrator and they implemented yep. it in an accumulator in a digital domain. Right. It's way more expensive to do that. Yeah, yeah. But now we're doing things like dynamic compensation that uh -huh. changes with the operating point. We do a lot of switching power supply design. We make the switching power supplies that people think are linear supplies. They yep. have low noise and they're super fast, fast transient response. Um, and we can do things in digital that we couldn't do in analog. And we wow. can do it more precisely. Yep. And, and we can simulate a lot of this stuff. In the analog domain, it was much more difficult to simulate, to get accurate characteristics of transistors. Mm -hmm. We now can correct for an anomalies that we couldn't correct for before and get higher performance, more efficiency, and there's no end to what we can do with it. I mean, it's really the sky's the limit. Because in the, um, like, uh, all the real high performance inverters, industrial inverters and things like that, they digitally characterize individual transistors and you can get the most efficiency mm -hmm. out of, are you guys doing Stuff like that? Yeah, we just came out with a, a, a very high voltage, very high power supply mm. to serve the automotive electric vehicle mm. market. And we're doing fully bi-directional power transfer. Yep. In that. And we're mapping into the line. Yeah. We're dumping power back in the line when you're, when you're sucking right. energy out of it. And we're putting power back in off the line with 100% power factor all done digitally. That's and brilliant. And we can get higher and higher levels of efficiency because, frankly, yep. when you're talking about 100,000 watts, 
people yeah, yeah. don't care for that heat in the room. <laughs> no, every 0.1% of efficiency matters at that well, the bigger problem is when they're testing these things in production, yeah. they would have to put liquid cooling towers in to take the heat out of the room because it would get to 120 degrees. Wow. Fahrenheit. So that by putting the energy back on the line, yep. they, they can dramatically simplify the manufacturing process. Fantastic. And, you know, factories don't care so much about efficiency. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not in terms of how much power costs are. Yep. But they do care about heat and the yes. HVAC and, yep. and noise and just the mess that comes from it. So that's... But the, the thing I was getting back to your original question, the, the, the digital domain allows us to do things we couldn't do in analog easily, mm -hmm. that wasn't predictable. Um, like? And, and, like accurate nonlinear feedback. Yep. Okay? To do nonlinear feedback in the analog domain involved diodes and zeners yeah, and yeah, things. Yeah, and nasty stuff. Nasty yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. wasn't it drifted yeah, and it nah, didn't work precisely. Yep. With digital, you have 16-bit accuracy at mm -hmm. very high bandwidths, and it's very, very predictable and modelable. So right. it's much, much better. It's just... We're learning how to develop the tools and the simulation technologies. The simulation technologies uh, take a lot of computer horsepower, mm -hmm. so we, we're constantly buying new servers, new new tools, faster tools. You can actually even ship the stuff off to people like Amazon and Google and use their server farms yep, to do course. simulations. Um, we're starting to do that, but it's um, getting our minds wrapped around it so everybody's adept. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how often I take a guy out of school who knows the analog because you have to start there and I say, but you're never going to use this. You're going to have right. to understand it, but you're going to do it all in digital demand. Yeah. You have to become an expert on FPGAs. And they go, oh, they, uh, they're, they're right. kind of shocked. That wow. I see. All of our I thought it'd be the opposite. I thought they'd be turn, churning out the digital gurus and nobody knows analog anymore. Nobody, well, the point is we hire, we try to hire analog people. Ah, we try okay. to find those, those right. rarest hence teeth people because you need to have that core you understanding right. before you go to the digital. You just can't send a digital jockey at the thing and expect them to come up with a good result. They have to have that, Interesting. that, that detail. You have to yep. have loop gain and all those things. Yeah, it, yeah, still yeah. it still matters. Yeah. It's done in the software domain and it's compensated for in that case. But right. you still have to understand the principles of how it all right. works and whatnot. And we're not the only ones. I mean, obviously our competitors are doing yeah. it as well. And What's also interesting is you can provide some of that to the customer. Mm -hmm. You can provide the adaptability that digital brings to bear in a soft fashion to the customer. So they can trade off stability versus dynamics. Yep. And, and some of our, our competitors offer that as well. And it's really allowing you to get more out of what you already have. Fantastic. Optimize it, yeah. I think we've got to call it quits, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Dave. It's been awesome. Yes, Thanks for coming absolutely. all the way here to I give us to do it your... again sometime. Yes. Catch you next time. Awesome. Hey, that was great. That was really good. Yeah. And it was recording the whole time. Yep, that's good. <laughs> <laughs>